so thanks very much for uh, this is my first draft day, so it's very exciting to, to be here and uh, participate. Uh, I've only been in the UK for a couple of years now, and uh, one of the projects that, that we've been doing is something that's continued from when I was in South Africa, um, and we started the Mufasa simulations because we ran them on a cluster that was named Pumbaa in Timon. Uh, the descendant of Mufasa is obviously Simba, so our next generation now is, is Simba. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Simba and Simba Lucid, which have been run on the giraffe machines and really been enabled by them because I think, uh, well, we could have done them without, without the big memory machines at Cosmo, but Cosmo 7, but, uh, but certainly they've helped a lot, right? Um, so we have a, a, a you know, growing team here. It's a small group. Um, and I'm going to try to make, keep this talk sort of at a more general scientific level so that, uh, you know, people who maybe aren't experts in the field can hopefully follow along, but if you have any, any sort of uh, questions or whatever, feel free. Okay. So what is the basic problem we're trying to solve? Uh, the basic problem is this, right? We have a picture of our baby universe. This is, this is it, okay, taken several different uh, improving facilities. This is a map of the cosmic microwave background fluctuations uh, occurring at about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, so in the universe about of its current age. Um, and the point about this, right, is we can map this out very precisely. And what these fluctuations are, they're very small fluctuations. They're like one part in 10 to the 6. And because of that, um, we can solve this mostly with pen and paper. Okay? So we know this one, right? And by, by measuring these fluctuations precisely, we can uh, infer things like what our universe is made of. You know, things like 5% of the universe is made up of stuff in the periodic table. About 30% is cold dark matter, and the rest is this dark energy stuff. Okay, so we know the initial conditions. Now we go to the universe today, and we go out and look at it, right, with something like the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is what we see, right? And this is kind of not a great image uh, here on this, on the, but what's amazing about this is that every point of light that you see here is another galaxy, right? This is how we mark out our universe. We, we're looking at galaxies. And the, the amazing thing you notice, several things about this, one, it's extremely nonlinear. Okay, these, are, these are very isolated patches. There's very little, apparently, in between. Um, the other thing is that there's an amazing diversity of objects in this, in this image. There's red things, there's spirally things, blue things, all kinds of different things. So the basic problem of galaxy formation then amounts to how do we start from those initial conditions, which we understand pretty well after the Big Bang, and get all of this, right? And the reason this is an interesting problem is it involves a huge amount of physics. Um, and a wide diversity of physics as well. Okay? So you can start with cosmology. Cosmology sets the overall growth of structure and the, and the rate at which uh, galaxies can, can grow. Um, but galaxies, most of what you see shining in these images is stars. Okay? So if we want to model galaxies, we're going to have to know something about how stars form. Um, stars don't just form and sit there. They evolve. They do all kinds of things. They go supernova. Uh, that, that does all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, they create heavy elements. Uh, you know, we are all made of star stuff, that sort of thing. Um, dark matter, of course, is a, a big component. Um, you know, everything is so far consistent with cold and collisionless, but um, you know, I think uh, we're you know a lot of the particle physics stuff that, that goes on in searching for dark matter is informed by galaxy scale observations. Um, you know, about 20 years ago, we started to realize that basically every massive galaxy of any size has a, has a big central supermassive black hole, and it seems to be doing stuff to the galaxy, which we don't quite understand why or how. Um, and then the thing that really bites you is the fact that galaxies are, are self-regulating systems, okay? Uh, in other words, galaxies are not just sort of, you know, that you look at a picture like this, you think, ah, oh, this thing's just floating off nicely in space. No, it's doing all kinds of things. Okay. Uh, it's, it's throwing material back out, there's material coming in, there's interaction with the surrounding gas. The problem when you look at this is you're only seeing the stars. There's all kinds of other stuff. There's stars, there's gas, there's dark matter, there's dust, there's, there's all kinds of other things going on. Right? And we have to model all of this if we want to get, get, to get pro uh, the galaxy properties correct. So this, of course, begs for numerical simulations. Okay? We can, you know, basically after the first uh, you know, early early stages, we can't do this on pen and paper anymore. Uh, we can't really even do this with, with simplified models. All right. So that's why we go to numerical simulations, right? And <clears throat> the idea is, of course, that we want to be able to take a representative volume of the universe and simulate the galaxy population and everything around it 
within that representative volume um, and include all the relevant physics that we think is important and we want to have it yield a, a realistic looking galaxy population. Okay, that's sort of step one, right? Once you do that, then you can do all kinds of fun science. Then you can start to use your, your uh, uh, simulations as numerical experiments. You can say, oh, I've got these you know, 17 different things of physics. What happens if I turn one or two on and off? And what happens, right? Um, you can use this to interpret data. So you, you know, people go out and measure all these, you know, look at all these galaxies, and they go, what the heck makes this galaxy different from that galaxy, right? Well, in our simulations, we can go, through, we know that in principle, right? We should be able to answer that sort of question. Uh, the other important thing is, of course, there's all kinds of future facilities. There's, you know, all these billion uh, dollar pound uh, euro uh, facilities going on, right? And we want to be able to use these things optimally. We want to be able to uh, extract the most science we can out of these things. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have to know. We have to be able to forward model what these uh, facilities will observe and understand what it is that we're going to be able to learn from that, right? So this is sort of guide the future facilities uh, type stuff. So these are all the things that we can do with the simulations. But step one is, you know, it doesn't help if you have a model that, that doesn't produce galaxies that look anything like a real universe. Nobody's going to pay the attention. And unfortunately, until about maybe five or seven years ago, that was pretty much the state of the field. Okay? Uh, that, that essentially, that we did not have simulations that could produce realistic galaxies. So why is that hard? Why, why has it been such a challenge to, to achieve this? And I've sort of already gone into it a little bit, but, but essentially there's two main problems. One is there's a huge range of physics, and there's a, the other is there's a huge range of scales okay, that we have to consider. Um, now, what are the different physics? Well, you know, there's some that's, that's sort of 19th, 20th century classic physics. Okay, we can do that, right? We know gravity, we know, you know, Euler's equations, et cetera, et cetera. We even have a pretty good idea about radio processes. That's fine, okay? So we can include that modular resolution effects, but we can test for that. But now we want to do things like form stars or, 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 or grow black holes in the, middles of, in the middle of galaxies. We want to understand how uh, the heavy elements uh, grow, all these sorts of things. Um, and this is occurring on scales that's much, much smaller than the sort of size of the you know, representative volume of the universe that we want to model. And so we cannot, in any reasonable future, model these processes directly within a cosmological volume. So we have to just develop some sort of uh, what you might call an effective theory right, for how these things work. And by doing that, we can include these processes in the simulations and understand, particularly, you know, this whole issue of self-regulation, right? The, the process of galaxy formation results in uh, energetic release from things like black holes and, and stars exploding that, uh, that curtails galaxy for growth, right? And it's this self-regulation that makes the problem extremely challenging because it's, it's effectively formally now a complex system, right? Galaxies self-regulate their own growth and the growth of other galaxies around. Um, then you have all sorts of optional things that we think might be important, but we're not sure, right? Uh, things like radiation transport, we know it's important at the epoch of ionization when the first stars started forming. Uh, magnetic fields, everybody always asks, what about magnetic fields, right? Uh, conduction, uh, cosmic rays, all these things, right, that may or may not be important, uh, but we can use the simulations as numerical experiments to test these things if we can figure out how to model them properly, right? Uh, the other issue is, of course, the dynamic range is very large. And so what we often do is sort of break up the problem into a variety of, of scales, right? So in the very largest volumes, gravity is sort of the dominant thing. We don't have to worry about all these little tech, you know, small scale things. So we can, we can try to use, uh, model gigaparsec cube volumes, you know, comparable to the you know, order of magnitude, comparable to the size of the universe. Uh, and this is very useful for cosmology. It doesn't really give you galaxies unless you somehow figure out how to paint the galaxies into your, into your dark matter. Um, so then, you know, for sort of, you know, if we go down for maybe three orders of magnitude in volume or order of magnitude in scale, uh, we get to sort of the cosmological regime. Okay, in the cosmological regime, we have sort of uh, scale uh, resolutions of this order, you know, somewhat smaller than, than galaxies. So we resolve galaxies by, you know, up order 10 resolution elements, right? So maybe 100 if you're lucky, all right? Um, so it's not great. But we can count things and we can get their properties reasonably well. But what we, you know, then what you want to do for even higher resolution is re-simulate individual objects. 
right? And this is the zoom technique that's become quite popular, uh, where you, you take an individual uh, galaxy in your, you know, one of these simulations and say, I'm going to just uh, resolve that one with very, with, at very high resolution, ignoring all the other galaxies. So you don't get statistics from this. But you can study uh, the things very well. So, uh, so these are the various things. And what we'd like to do, of course, is to sort of combine all this information into an overall picture of how things work. So um, this is a very you know, uh, uh, active industry. Okay, A lot of people are doing this. So I'm just going to flash through some of the some of the key simulations. So I'm probably not including all of them, but of course you've already heard about the Eagle simulations. One of the, I think still was run about five years ago, still extremely successful. Um, so run on, on uh, <coughs> with your act machines, uh, illustrious and its follow-up illustrious TNG simulations. Right. So this is another huge effort that's uh, you know, international effort. Uh, Magneticum coming from uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, the Fable simulations in, in Cambridge, Deborah's involved with this. Uh, Sherwood, another thing run on Dirac. Uh, the Horizon AGN, that's a French group that's, that's doing that. Uh, Blue Waters, which is out of Carnegie Mellon in the US. The point is, like, every, all kinds of people are all running these types of simulations. Now, why is everybody doing this? Why, why do we need all these things, right? Well, the reason we want to do all this is that everybody sort of has slightly different ways I've been doing all the things we were talking about before, all these various physical processes. And the hope is that if we are able to uh, uh, <coughs> examine exactly how uh, these sorts of the implement the detailed implementations are able to reflect in observations, we might be able to learn something about which ones are, are, are sort of you know, more likely to be closer to the truth. And the point is that, that you know, there are free parameters in these, uh, the, these sort of models. Uh, and with appropriate tuning, you can typically uh, match a decent amount of observations. So all of these simulations at some level, you know, some better than others, uh, match, match a, a range of key observations. Okay, so this is sort of the state. And what about our simulation? So why, why did we bother um, running this, running a new set of simulations, right? And our approach has been not necessarily to do uh, the largest simulations, I think that's, that's still uh, Blue Waters is the largest hydrodynamic simulation, but it was so large they could only run it for the first billion years of the universe, not even that. Um, but, uh, but basically to instead uh, do new physics, right? To do physics in a way that's different than what pretty much most everyone else has done. Okay? And that's, that's really been the, the unique part of what, uh, what we've done over the last few years with Blue and Zimba. So the first unique thing is we use uh, a new hydrodynamics method, okay, that was it's not that new actually, it's been around for a while, but it was implemented in a cosmological simulation uh, or code fairly recently. It's called a gizmo uh, simulate, uh, gizmo code, and this is this meshless finite mass method, and it does, it has nice properties, right? Uh, it, it has very nice handling of, of, of shock and, and surface instabilities. Uh, it's a mass conserving code. So it has a, a lot of the same advantages of something like a repo, but it's, uh, it, it, because it's mass conserving, you can do things like trap gas elements around, which is really useful for understanding how things are working. Uh, and it does nice things, so if you want to evolve an equilibrium disk, which should just sit there, right? This is what happens with modern SPH, old SPH, uh, sort of a mesh code, right? And then this is what happens with, with Gizmo, right? It's over 100 rotation periods, other than numerical noise, it sits there. That's what it should do. So if you think that galaxies are disks, this is a good thing to be able to solve correctly. Turns out it doesn't make a huge difference, like a lot of uh, models use this type of thing. It doesn't actually make an enormous difference for the resulting properties, but it's nice. But there are many other things that we do that are quite unique. So for instance, um, one of the ways that people typically model uh, the, the feedback from star formation is you assume some functional form for how it works, you have several free parameters, and then you start fiddling the knobs, right? And you say, oh, I want to match this data, and I get close to right, right? But what we did was said, wait a minute, there are these people running these very high resolution zoom simulations, right? And they're get predicting what these mass outflow rates and things should be. They're predicting what feedback should be doing. So why don't we just use that information as sort of the effective theory to put into our large lower resolution simulations? We did sort of the same thing with, uh, so that's, that's basically uh, an example of that. We did the same thing with sort of black holes. Uh, we have uh, a model that, that basically no one else so far uses. Uh, which relies on angular momentum loss rather than uh, gravitational capture from a hot medium. Um, we 
employ, try to employ uh, black hole feedback, which turns out to be quite important, uh, directly as an observate, as observed, right? So when in galaxies, we see that the black holes often uh, put out these huge high velocity relativistic jets. So we say that, okay, let's implement this in our simulation, right? Not necessarily the detailed relativistic part, but the, the impacts on large scales, okay? So th with this sort of approach, right, and then the other thing that we have that's, that's fairly unique is, is that we actually track dust directly in the simulation. Dust is very important for galaxies. It can obscure a lot of light, can uh, produce infrared properties. So we do all these unique things, and we say that, okay, this is a sort of a new way of, uh, you know, a new set of physics. You know, how does it work? Does it work as well as, you know, other people's simulations? And the answer is it works at least as well, if not better. Okay? So one of the standard ways we, we sort of benchmark these things is this thing called the stellar mass function. What it is is essentially a counting statistic, the number density of galaxies at a variety of, of stellar masses. Okay? The observations are shown in black points. The Simba predictions are shown in the green points. And just for comparison, Eagle, which is, again, like I said, pretty much otherwise you know, the best simulation out there in terms of matching data, that's shown as these sort of uh, dotted so as you can see, we do a very good job of matching it all the way from when the universe was only like one billion years old to essentially today. All right? And that's, again, fairly unprecedented. Um, we can alternatively view this as, a, as the, the, the cosmic density of star formation. So if you look at a cubic megaparsec of the universe, what is the overall star formation rate in that cubic megaparsec? And that's the observations in black and, and Simba produced. So that's quite nice. In fact, um, the cool thing about these kind of simulations is that you have access to a large number of different types of uh, observations. Uh, so for instance, uh, just look at the sort of bottom here. Uh, this shows the Andromeda galaxy, right, seen in a number of different um, wavelengths. So radio, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray. The point is, when you're looking at these different wave bands, you're looking at different parts of the galaxy. You're looking at different things in the galaxy. That's why we do this, right? That's why we could try to collect this sort of multi wavelength data. So radio, you're looking at the neutral hydrogen, the 21 centimeter emission, dust emission here, the stars, the star formation rate, or young stars here, and X-rays is, is up in the black holes. So by having a model that contains all these components, again, we can now investigate the interrelationship. How does one relate to the other? Where is it all coming from? Why is it all there? Um, and the point is that, that Simba can match these different components that we've just looked at say the mass function of the stars, the neutral hydrogen, the black holes, the dust, uh, or observed galaxy populations, which are in the black, and Simba, which is in the green, and you see that that agreement is very good, okay? Um, I'll just say no other simulation really comes close to this in terms of matching data. Um, so, <clears throat> again, we want to include, uh, we want to produce both, both star-forming galaxies and quenched galaxies, it turns out we can do that with our black hole feedback, which turned out to be quite nice. A uh, key way to look at this is what's often called a color magnitude diagram. So this basically, uh, the, the non-star forming galaxies are, are sort of reddish and up at the top, and the bluer star forming galaxies are at the bottom. Just to give you sort of an idea of what the observations look like, there's this sort of thing called a red sequence in the blue cloud, and we produce a red sequence in a blue cloud, basically uh, in agreement with observation. This was, again, extremely hard to achieve, I think, uh, now, Eagle can do it, illustrious TNG can do it, I'm not sure anyone else can. Uh, so that again shows you that, that you know, this sort of approach has been very effective. We can look at the black hole properties versus stellar mass. Uh, you know, I, won't, I won't go into too much detail, but one thing I will say is that you know, you can, what you can see is that things with large black holes tend to be, have to be red, so that means they're not star forming. And this is an example of a numerical experiment. Suppose we were to take our source exact simulation and simply turn off that jet feedback part. This is what we get. So all these galaxies that were massive up here that were all really red are now all blue. They're now star forming. So essentially, the, this, this just very directly tells us that that black hole jet feedback is the thing that's creating this nice uh, red sequence. Right? Um, so there's a large number of projects that are going on with Simba. Um, it, it, by the way, it took about 1.5 million uh, CPU hours on, on Cosmos 7. Uh, I won't go into all of this. We're, we're working a lot on, on analysis tools, so on and so forth. Um, so <clears throat> um, the, the, the next sort of thing that we, that we thought about after we sort of ran this was, okay, this is, this is really nice. This is a random patch of the universe. 
And suppose, wouldn't it be cool if rather than simulating a random patch of the universe, we could really simulate the universe around us, right? Suppose we could do that, right? So people have been thinking about doing this for quite some time, and particularly we partnered with a group in China who ran the Elucid simulation, okay? Uh, what is the Elucid simulation? So this simulation, just as background, was a dark matter only simulation. But what they did was they said, okay, here is the observed distribution of galaxies that we see from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. All right? We're going to create a density map of this. We're going to, with very sophisticated techniques, including the velocity information and all that, take that back in time to some initial conditions at redshift 130, or some very, very early time, create initial conditions, and then we're going to run the simulation forward with our, uh, with our in-body code. And we should produce a mass distribution that looks a lot like the, the, the actual density field we see around us. We should be able to say, hey, look, there's the coma cluster in our simulation, right? And, we can, and they can do that. So that's what they did. So this is the actual simulation that, that they ran. Again, pure in-body, right? Uh, and you see a lot of the structures basic, on large scales basically match up. So, <clears throat> Um, you, and, you know, this is just an example of what we can get. Now we can actually look at the coma cluster and uh, see it in its, all its dark matter. This is, you know, our, the, the, the elucid, rather, uh, a map of the coma cluster. So our idea was say, why don't we do this now with gas? Why don't we do it with our full model that, that works to produce all these galaxies and stuff like that? Um, so we take the SIMBA model and we run it on the elucid initial conditions. Now, in order to do that, unfortunately, we had to sort of reduce the volume uh, because, you know, these the high proposals are a lot slower, so we couldn't do the full volume. Um, but it still ended up with a lot more particles than, uh, than Simba. Simba had about 1024 cube particles. This one has around 1500 cube uh, in, in each. Um, so the mass resolution is worse. So we're, we're not resolving to such low mass galaxies anymore. However, the volume is much larger. Okay, so we can really represent sort of rare objects. Um, so this was what we applied to for, for our director's discretionary time. We got 2.8 million uh, node hours awarded. Um, we had some technical issues. Actually, we, we, actually this is great because it gave us a chance to, to, uh, to sort out a lot of technical issues we had with running simulations of this size. In the end, we were only able to use 2 million up to the, the uh, end of March, which is when our hours expired. Uh, we already knew we needed probably about six million to complete it, so we knew we weren't going to actually complete the whole thing, but we got uh, part of the way, and so we already got some pretty cool results out of it. So for instance, this is actually the map of the gas distribution of the, uh, essentially the progenitor about 10 billion years ago of our local universe with our simulation. Okay. Uh, we can ma measure a mass, stellar mass function again, like we can do, just to check that everything's going okay, and in fact it is, right, our, our mass function just like with Simba, Simba Lucid produces a good mass function. Doesn't go to quite such low masses, but we get the very rare uh, large objects now. Okay. So with Simba Lucid now, we're hoping that we'll be able to uh, literally produce a, a, a mock local universe out to about a couple of hundred megaparsecs uh, with all the galaxy information, all the gas information, all that sort of thing that, uh, you know, that observations can't easily detect directly. Right? And that's, I think, going to be a real prize when, we, when we're able to achieve that. Um, okay, well that's basically all I had to say. Um, so I think SIMBA you know, is, is, a, is a great state-of-the-art framework. I think it's uh, uh, for doing lots of things, and there's a huge number of things going on with it right now. Uh, we're basically, you know, this, in as much as possible, this, all this stuff is public, right? We, we, we are happy to give it away. Right now we don't have sort of a, a portal set up for this, but we're working with the people at the Simons Foundation, the Center for Astrophysics to do this so that we can we can disseminate this data. The, all the tools that we use to analyze it are all publicly available. So you know we want people to, to use the simulation, download it, use it for their own nefarious purposes, whatever it is, and uh, and get get interesting results out of it. So I think it'll be a, a great a great tool to add to all the other simulations like Eagle, Eagle XL, um, Illustrious, TNG, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm very excited about the Simba Lucid project. We're trying to figure out how exactly we can get it down to rich of zero, um, and, uh, but, but I think they'll certainly get there over the next year, one year, and they'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Emil. We have five minutes for questions. Yes. 
for the uh, Simbra Lucid project. So, Shai Ganel had this paper a couple of years ago, I think some other people have had on these as well, this butterfly effect idea, where if you take a cosmological simulation and you perturb it slightly, then you get completely different galaxy properties. Well, not completely different, but significantly different galaxy properties at the uh, ratio of zero compared to the one that you didn't perturb. You know? So, my question is like, how, how do you make sure that the galaxies that you get are the real galaxies, and, you know, is your random number generator the same one that the real universe has? It's like yes. No. Uh, uh, no, that's a great question. Uh, so again, you know, one of the so one of the arts of doing these types of simulations, right? There's a lot of science here, but one of the arts of doing these simulations is knowing what you can trust and what you can't trust, right? And that's often, I think, you know, one of the most difficult things that's, that's because you can get so much information out of these things. You think, oh, yeah, I can look at that exact galaxy, which should be a replica of that exact galaxy. No, it, that depends, right? Uh, the central galaxy in the coma cluster, yes. You know, that's a big object that, the, <coughs> that you know, was, was essentially one of the key things that was used to generate the initial conditions. Okay, that one is probably okay. But if you start to talk about some of the surrounding galaxies and stuff, they're not going to match up exactly. Absolutely not. And so that's that's uh, you have to you have to be careful how you use that information. Yeah. Uh, that's really a very nice talk, and uh, thank you for being so uh, complimentary. Very important. Yeah. I have a question about the last uh, very exciting things that we're doing. So the uh, two questions. One is in the constraint realization, <coughs> there is a spatial Resolution limit. Um, can you tell what that is? So I think that addresses Josh's question. Yes. Uh, and also, exactly. what is the mass, the gas mass particle that you have? So five times where, but I see. Ah, right, right, right. So the, the particle mass is approaching 10 to the 8 solar masses in gas, okay. so it's fairly low resolution. So the, spatial, uh, the spatial resolution we're running at is, I think, uh, 3 kiloparsecs. No, I don't mean in terms of sovereignty, I mean when you do constraint realization. Ah, uh, right, right, right. So, so yes, yes. So, uh, correct, correct. It, it was smooth on a scale. Oh, I'm trying to remember exactly what the number was, but it was it was megaparsec ish. On that case. Uh, so yes. So yeah, yeah. Very nice. You haven't had a chance to compare, but those those it worked worthwhile doing all the uh, gas and so on. I mean, if you populate the halos with galaxies uh, in some simple way, as long as matching or something, do you find big differences? Yeah, it is. Uh, well, certainly that would be interesting to look at. I think the, the main issue is uh, naturally, you know, if you have a something like a semi elliptic model, you can tune it to match the, the, the observations and it will look at the data. Uh, I think the value added part of the, the gas dynamical simulation so that we understand uh, the various phases, particularly of the surrounding gas. Yeah. Um, and uh, we understand essentially being able to track the material around and understand how these galaxies uh, grew in these particular environments. Right? And so I think that's that's where we we get we learn a lot of the physics, and I think that's where a lot of the interesting questions are right now. Yeah, Steve. Is there any critical physics for No, I think I think basically we're still struggling with the physics. So, um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of the feedback processes are here are described very heuristically, essentially with with equations. We can get those equations from other simulations, but ultimately we want to know what is the physics driving, you know, black hole jets and the interaction with the surrounding medium. So, I think the number one question right now is what is the physics actually giving rise to all these feedback processes? And that's why you know all these simulations are being run because all of them basically have different implementations of that, and we want to be able to test that. Uh, and so I think this is one of the examples where, where SWIFT is going to be super super exciting uh, because we're going to have a single code hopefully that is that is, a, that is very modular and will have a many different of these uh, these versions in there, and we'll be able to turn things off individually and understand exactly how it, a particular physical implementations reflect in the resulting galaxy. So it really is all about the, the input physics at this point and, and constraining that. Okay. Can you comment on the trade-off? If you had a code for say a thousand times faster, yeah. you could do a thousand simulations with a thousand sets of RNG inputs yeah. and so on. And you would presumably for statistical properties or some volume you want it would really have to be so bigger volume from the physical perspective, just gaining statistics by and if you get that either. Yeah, 
So I think this has been one of the one of the differences in our approach versus people like Illustrious, who um, and also Eagle run you know, these heroic one big simulations. But then they have you know Eagle I think did a lot of exploration. Um, so we try to run simulations in a variety of different uh, sizes. So we have the 100 megaparsec box that I talked about. We're also running a 50 and a 25 megaparsec box. So the idea is to be able to combine these things and expand your dynamic range. That works for a lot of things, but it doesn't work for everything. So, so the problem is that in any given simulation, your dynamic range is then limited compared to the big one, and therefore you're, you're sort of limited in the, the, the properties that you can examine on small scales relative to what you have on large scales. So there's advantages to doing both. Uh, but I agree that there is a trade-off there, and, and it is a lot cheaper to run you know, 10 you know, simulations of one-tenth the size, right? because it doesn't scale that well. Okay, we have to leave it there. Thank you.